Number 9. Kasatka Laboratory number 5 RI-400, or Kasatka for short, was a top-secret Soviet research lab located along the Black Sea in what is now a contested territory that technically belongs to Georgia. The clandestine site was staffed by German scientists who were captured during World War II. For a decade after the war ended, they were forced to work for the Soviets, researching nuclear physics and developing experimental torpedo and underwater mine technology. The laboratory was deserted around the time the Soviet Union fell in 1991. Since then, it's become a decrepit shell of its former self, with shattered windows, peeling paint, crumbling concrete, and debris strewn throughout the seemingly post-apocalyptic site, which is slowly being reclaimed by nature. There are ransacked cabinets thrown onto the floor, a 1986 calendar on the wall, safety posters, decaying machinery, old moldy books still lining shelves against the wall, and a wet, rusting space where the scientists perform the research. In this area, there are rows upon rows of corroding torpedoes, which were used in auto-homing experiments. The staff also searched for ways to make the weapons more powerful, in case the USSR ever saw the need to attack a NATO vessel. The Georgian government originally planned to keep Kasatka open for civilian maritime research after a series of civil wars, but the conflicts rendered the country more or less broke, and it could no longer afford to continue operating the site and the lab is located in a contested territory with an uncertain future, known as Abkhazia. Only a handful of countries recognize it as an independent state as it campaigns for freedom with the help of the Unrepresented Nations and People's Organization. With that going on, it seems unlikely that Kasatka will ever be restored or preserved as a historic site. Number 8. Russia's Chemical Weapons Graveyards in 1998, the Washington Post reported on a chemical weapons graveyard in Leonidovka, Russia. Located in the middle of a lush forest, the site was marked by the sudden absence of greenery. Soviet military veteran turned environmentalist Vladimir Pankratov led journalist David Hoffman to the unmistakable clearing where the dark soil contrasts with the surrounding vegetation. After poking at the ground with a stick for a short time, Pankratov revealed the nose cone of an aerial bomb. Described by Hoffman as an uncharted chemical weapons graveyard, the site is just one of several examples of the problems Russia deals with as the country with the most chemical bombs, which it agreed by treaty to destroy. Yet the country has so many explosives lying around, it reportedly can't get rid of or even find them all. And according to Hoffman, the Russian military created the so-called undeclared dump starting in the early 60s and still did denies that they exist. A team of experts detected heavy levels of arsenic in the soil, and the site reportedly emits a heavy metallic odor. They also allegedly found the poison in soil and water samples alarmingly close to a region with a population of over 500,000 people. The weapons graveyard at Leonidovka aimed to keep the public out with only a simple sign warning them not to enter. Simply put, long after the Cold War ended, the weapons that were developed during it and their byproducts continue to pollute the environment. Number 7. Explosion in Ethiopia in late 2020, three people died in the Lidera neighborhood of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia when an abandoned bomb exploded. At the time, there was an ongoing crisis in the country's northern Tigray region, where federal and regional troops had come head-to-head -head in their disagreements. Authorities reassured the public that the explosion had nothing to do with the fighting, which by then had forced some 50,000 refugees into neighboring Sudan. Around that time, other so-called abandoned bombs had been found or detonated throughout the region, but people were left unharmed for the most part, according to the BBC. Reuters reportedly blamed the Tigray People's Liberation Front, a left-wing nationalist paramilitary group that was entangled in the crisis, but the media agency failed to back these claims up with evidence. Ethiopia's state-owned news agency said that there was an ongoing investigation into the explosion and promised to provide regular updates as the situation unfolded. Just days later, another abandoned bomb exploded, claiming 
the lives of two children aged 8 and 5 years old. Independent news company Ethiopian Citizen reported that these were just two of several incidents that left citizens injured or dead. Since then, the tensions in Ethiopia have erupted into a full-blown civil war with no end in sight. Things have allegedly become so dire that even the doctors and nurses who are tasked with treating injured people in the Tigray region have resorted to begging for food to keep themselves nourished. Sadly, it seems as though the situation could continue for a while or perhaps worsen, forcing civilians to suffer from food shortages, abandoned bombs, and the other disturbing effects of war that they don't deserve. Number 6. A Neighborhood Filled With Explosives It's probably easy to assume that not many unexploded bombs get left on American soil. After all, the last several wars that the US was involved in happened outside the country. But the military still has to test and train with explosives. And while much of this activity has been carried out on remote islands with little concern for how local populations would be affected, it was also occasionally done within American borders. In 2007, someone discovered a bomb near a running track outside a middle school in Orlando, Florida. As it turned out, the school and numerous residences were built on the site of a former bombing range. Talk about danger. It soon became clear that the military had left the property riddled with bombs, and the subsequent builders failed to thoroughly inspect the land for anything dangerous before starting construction. And it soon surfaced that the neighborhood had been identified as a Superfund site all the way back in 1994. This priority status is assigned to properties throughout the US that are found to be contaminated with hazardous substances. Within two years of the first discovery in the Orange County community, over 400 live bombs and rockets were found on the school's property and in people's yards. That's quite a lot. The Army Corps of Engineers carried out a $10 million cleanup. When they were finished, they said that it's still possible, but highly unlikely, for someone to stumble upon a live explosive. It's not exactly the type of thing many people like to take their chances with, even if those chances are slim. Consequently, property values in the area have plummeted, making it nearly impossible for many residents to move away without suffering from major financial losses. And this isn't the only place in the US that's littered with unexploded bombs either. Number 5. Munitions in Manipur during the latter stages of World War II, the conflict between the Allied and the Axis powers found its way to the state of Manipur in northeastern India, along the border with Myanmar. It was here that US forces came face to face with the Japanese as they invaded the country. After the fighting ended, the Allies buried unexploded bombs, and the consequences have been catastrophic for the people who have lived in the region ever since, including modern-day residents. Late last year, Lal Sangwon Gangte and his brother Lenkogen were digging a pit behind their courtyard in the town of More, when one of them unknowingly hit a bomb with their spade, causing it to explode. They were both killed. Rajeshwar Yumnam, who heads the Imphal Campaign Foundation, told the Dakan Herald that there's an ongoing issue with World War II bombs in the area, hurting and killing people. He said that 15 or 20 years ago, an explosion killed several kids. It wasn't covered heavily in the media, leaving one to wonder just how often things like this happen and go largely unreported. Nicknamed the Forgotten Front, India played an important and complicated role in the war one that seems to be largely overlooked today. So it comes as a surprise to many that there are so many unexploded bombs littering the subcontinent, especially in the jungle. But perhaps it should be customary to teach a more thorough version of history to school children. Do you think kids should be learning about this in school? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and be sure to subscribe while you're at it. Number 4. 
Tragedies in the Congo The Democratic Republic of Congo is Africa's second largest country. It's known for its abundance of natural resources, including oil, gold, diamonds, and other materials. Yet nearly two-thirds of its people live in dire poverty, surviving on less than $2 a day. And these conditions, along with ethnic tensions and other dividing factors, create the perfect recipe for conflict. For decades, the country has been plagued by armed fighting, political instability, and human rights violations. Two wars were fought in the Congo from 1996 and 2003, including a brutal war between 25 armed groups from nine different countries. Since then, there have been many tragedies throughout the country involving the accidental detonation of unexploded bombs left behind from the conflict. In 2001, for example, a man and a 10-year-old child were killed when a blacksmith in Brazzaville mistook a bomb for ordinary metal and threw it into his furnace. The entire shop blew up, claiming the lives of both the blacksmith and the boy who was helping him, and seriously injuring a woman who was passing by when the explosion occurred. A year earlier, 11 kids died while playing with a shell they found on their school playground, obviously with no understanding of how dangerous the object was. Sadly, the hostilities in the Congo continue to this day. It's clear that war could break out at any time as tensions remain high and occasionally erupt into turmoil, and the risks of someone unintentionally setting off a bomb remain ever-present. Number 3. Leftover Bombs in Laos during the Vietnam War, Laos became the world's most heavily bombed country. Between 1964 and 1973, over 2 million metric tons of explosives were dropped, the equivalent of 1 metric ton per person, based on the population at the time. These airstrikes were carried out by the U.S. as a way of disrupting movement along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and preventing supplies from reaching the North Vietnamese. It was the largest bombing campaign in history, killing around 30,000 Laotians during the war, including children. Up to one-third of the bombs that rained over the country never exploded. They were simply left wherever they landed, posing a constant threat to locals. At least 20,000 people have died at the hands of leftover explosives since the war ended, and these abandoned weapons continue to maim and kill to this day. There are said to be as many as 80 million bombs littering the land. Numerous nonprofits are working diligently to clean the unexploded ordnance, including the UK based Mines Advisory Group. Slowly but surely, progress is being made. On the 25th anniversary of the project in 2019, MAG announced that it had disposed of its 250,000th bomb. Just two years later, in late 2021, the group removed its 300,000th bomb from the ground, marking yet another milestone in its quest to help make Laos safe again. But there's still plenty of work left to do before the country's citizens can traverse the landscape without risking their lives. Number 2. World War II Bombs in Germany Out of the 2.7 million tons of bombs that the US and Britain dropped on Europe between 1940 and 1945, half fell on Germany. The country's landscape was largely crippled, more closely resembling an otherworldly moonscape than anything of this world. After the war, reconstruction began almost immediately, even though roughly 10% of the bombs dropped on Germany never exploded. Both East and West Germany were rebuilt atop tens of thousands of tons of unexploded ordnance. Police bomb disposal technicians on both sides were tasked with taking care of the hazardous materials. But they didn't get everything. As recently as 2016, at least 2,000 tons of undetonated bombs were being found in Germany every year. The government takes plenty of precautions, including requiring a thorough inspection of a parcel of land before any sort of construction begins. And still, some bombs go undetected. In 2015, for example, 20,000 people were evacuated in Dortmund after a bomb was discovered mid-construction. Just a few years earlier in 2011, 45,000 people were evacuated when a similar device was exposed during a drought. It was the largest evacuation in Germany since World War II. 
Since the year 2000, 11 bomb technicians have died, despite the country being at peace for over three generations. Speaking with Smithsonian Magazine, bomb technician Horst Reinhardt said that he never expected to be doing his job for upwards of 30 years. He also mentioned that the city of Oranienburg is Germany's most dangerous city, experiencing almost daily bomb-related issues. It appears as though the leftover munitions from one of history's darkest chapters may continue to haunt the country for years to come. Number 1. Backyard Bomb it's shockingly somewhat common for explosives from past wars to be found buried in close proximity to places where people live, work, and socialize. Late last year, a 550-pound World War II-era bomb turned up during a community cleanup outside the Australian city of Victoria in the coastal town of Barwon Heads. Antiques dealer Ian Royce came and removed the weapon from someone's backyard, loaded it onto his truck, and took it to his shop. He told local station 9 News that the bomb was a sea mine that would have been chained to the bottom of the ocean during the war. It was jam-packed with TNT and had small, sensitive spines that would cause the weapon to detonate upon even the slightest contact from a passing ship. After the war, many sea mines were decommissioned and repurposed as backyard incinerators, which explains how the bomb ended up right outside a resident's home. There were no pickup services for organic waste or green rubbish back then, so people simply burned it in their backyards. Thankfully, since the bomb was decommissioned, it didn't pose a threat to anyone's safety. Royce is selling the artifact for an asking price of 1,200 Australian dollars. Number 10. World War II Tank and Other Vehicles Saipan is the largest of the Mariana Islands, a commonwealth of the U.S. located some 5,900 miles from the American mainland in the western Pacific Ocean. It's here that the United States and Japan went head-to-head -head in the Battle of Saipan from June 15 to July 9, 1944. The skirmish ended with a U.S. victory and the capture of Saipan from the Japanese. There are numerous historical sites on the island that were left behind by both the U.S. and Japan. Several Sherman M4 tanks were deserted off Chalan Kanoa Beach, where they can be found today sitting in about 10 feet of water. They remain intact and are easy and popular diving attractions. There are also two submerged Japanese planes, two American planes, a handful of merchant ships, some landing vehicles, and more. Divers can explore these and other vehicles, including the wrecked Japanese naval ship Shoan Maru, which sits in about 30 feet of water. For more experienced adventurers, there's an underwater pile of World War II junk filled with airplane parts, jeeps, and other items that the Navy discarded during its time on Saipan. Number 9. Grossinger's Resort Located about a two-hour drive from New York City, the Catskills are popular among New Yorkers as a place to get away from the hustle and bustle of the Big Apple. Nicknamed the Borscht Belt or the Jewish Alps, the region became especially popular among Jewish families who established numerous kosher resorts between the 1920s and the 60s. As flights to Miami and other beach destinations became cheaper, these establishments declined in popularity and were mostly all closed by the 1970s. One resort that survived longer than most was Grossinger's in the town of Liberty. Described in a 1954 review as the Waldorf in the Catskills, it's said to be the inspiration for the movie Dirty Dancing. Grossinger's was all about luxury. It was the first resort in the U.S. to use artificial snow for its ski runs and was known to frequently attract celebrity visitors. The sprawling family-owned business spanned 1,200 acres and consisted of over 35 buildings. It had its own private airfield, a golf course, hotel space, a massive dining room that could seat 1,300 guests, an ice rink, a nightclub, an indoor pool, and more. The resort began to decline after its owner, Jenny Grossinger, passed away in 1972. It closed its doors for good in 1986 and fell into disrepair. Nature reclaimed the space, serving as a sad reminder that Liberty's glory days were over. The town eventually decided to pursue economic growth by raising the defunct resort so that something can take its place. Demolition began in 2018, but the resort and its ruins live on in photographs. Number 8. Temple of Santiago A brutal drought hit southern Mexico in 2015, causing local water levels to drop dramatically. In the state of Chiapas, a 16th century church emerged from the Nezahualcoyotl Reservoir, where it normally sat 100 feet underwater. Known as the Temple of Santiago, the church was built in 1564 in anticipation of a population surge in the region. 
But Chiapas never became the bustling urban center it was envisioned to become. Architect Carlos Navarretes said that the Temple of Santiago probably never even had a dedicated priest. The church was abandoned during a plague that lasted from 1773 to 1776. Its ruins were submerged in 1966 with the creation of the reservoir. Since then, the water has dropped low enough for people to walk through the site on at least two occasions in 2002 and 2015. Ironically, the Temple of Santiago seems much more celebrated in modern times than it was in the colonial era. Whenever it reappears, locals flock to the site to explore, eat, and socialize. Would you check out this site if you were in the region when water levels dropped? Tell me in the comments below. Number 7. Kayakoy. Nestled among Turkey's Taurus Mountains near the Mediterranean coastline, there's a village filled with weathered streets and decaying stone buildings. It's quite clear from looking at it that nobody lives there. Built during the 18th century as Carmilasos, the town was originally home to a Greek Orthodox population. By the early 20th century, it was home to as many as 20,000 residents. From 1919 to 1922, the Greeks and Turks fought over competing land claims in what became known as the Greco-Turkish War. The violence that came along with the Greek loss was often aimed at Orthodox communities in Turkish territory. Many villages fled in droves, while others chose to stay. In the meantime, Turkish Muslims in Greece bore the brunt of the country's rivalry. To curb the bloodshed, the Greek and Turkish governments began a population exchange in 1923. This meant that even though the residents of Kayakoy had been lucky enough to continue living peacefully among their Turkish neighbors, they had no choice but to leave and return to Greece. The war and ensuing population exchange created a refugee crisis in both countries as authorities scrambled to find housing for the influx of residents, yet the 350 houses in Kayakoy remained vacant. Resettled Turkish Muslims didn't want to live in empty Greek Orthodox villages because of rumors they'd heard about the death that happened in some of them. Time has taken a toll on Kayakoy's buildings, which look more ancient than they really are. They remain standing as a historical monument and a reminder of the forced relocation that upended hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Number 6. Quinlan Castle If you've driven through the streets of Birmingham, Alabama, you might have seen a seemingly out-of-place building that resembles a castle. Located along 9th Avenue, this medieval-style four-story structure is an abandoned apartment complex known as Quinlan Castle. Its designer, William Welton, was inspired by the castles he saw over in Europe during World War I. During World War II, there were rumors that Quinlan Castle operated as a secret Nazi or communist stronghold. The police investigated but found no evidence to support these claims. To get away from the negative reputation that the ordeal left the building with, its owner renamed it the Royal Arms Apartments. Its new slogan was Living Quarters Fit for a King. The site was abandoned sometime during the 1990s and was left to deteriorate as the city tried figuring out what to do with it. A nonprofit science research organization called Southern Research recently bought the property, where it plans to build a new center dedicated to studying infectious diseases. Quinlan Castle was demolished at the end of January to make room for the building that will replace it. Number 5. The Bay of Abandoned Hotels Along the Adriatic coastline near the Croatian seaside town of Kupari, there's a collection of five derelict, overgrown hotels that have clearly all seen better days. Nicknamed the Bay of Hotels, they were built during the 1960s when what was now Croatia was part of Yugoslavia. The upscale hotels could accommodate up to 1,600 people altogether. Nearby, there was a campground with room for 4,000 people as well as numerous private villas. The resort was built largely with military funding, and as it grew in popularity, it became increasingly difficult for ordinary people to book a room. Consequently, it became known as a place for the military elite. Things changed drastically throughout the region after Croatia declared independence from Yugoslavia in 1991. A war ensued and Croatian soldiers took up residence at the hotels. Over a several-week period, Yugoslavian forces destroyed the resort that they had created, looting and burning the hotels in a bid to drive out the Croatians. The war ended in 1995 with a Croatian victory, but the region is still littered with reminders of the violence today, with once bustling sites simply left to rot. But the area has seen an uptick in vacationers in recent years, and the decaying hotels are catching investors' attention, suggesting that the property may be revived at some point in the near future. Would you visit this region and check out the ruins, or wait for a revival? Tell me in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Number 4 a western village in Japan. Roughly 70 miles north of Tokyo near the city of Nikko, there's a deserted theme park resembling a western town. 
Here you'll see a Mount Rushmore replica, American flags, and the same types of buildings that once filled America's boomtowns during the Gold Rush era, including a saloon, sheriff's station, prison, general store, and a blacksmith shop. Opened in 1973, the park was inspired by classic Western films as well as the sci-fi movie Westworld. It closed in 2007 and has since become an attraction for urban explorers. The overgrowth that has taken over simply adds to the eeriness of the large robots and sculptures of characters that can be seen throughout the property. Because it's located near the sleepy suburb of Shin Takatoku, where not much goes on, it's unlikely that the park will be torn down anytime soon to make way for development. So it'll hopefully remain open to curious visitors for years to come. Number 3. Wittenoom Founded in 1946, Wittenoom was a Western Australian mining town that was built to house workers for a nearby asbestos mine. At the time, the dangers of asbestos weren't widely known, so people didn't think twice about harvesting or using it, and it was a common building material. Wittenoom's population grew rapidly. By the early 1950s, it was the largest town in northwestern Australia's Pilbara region with a population of nearly 900 residents. People stopped using asbestos as they caught on to the health hazards it poses. The demand for the raw material fell, and in 1966 the mines at Wittenoom were closed. More than 2,000 cancer-related deaths have been traced to the deadly mining activities there. The Australian government began to phase down the population in 1978, but some were reluctant to leave despite the dangers associated with Wittenoom. They rejected the state's offers to buy their properties as the authorities began demolishing houses and closed the town's motel, gas station, pub, police station, and airport. The electricity was cut in 2006, and in 2007, mail stopped being delivered there. In 2008, Wittenoom was condemned. Still, a handful of residents refused to leave, and several of the town's buildings still stand. There are two remaining permanent residents today who continue to defy the government's plans to bulldoze the town and decontaminate the area. Lawmakers have introduced legislation to seize the remaining inhabited properties from their owners. It seems as though Wittenoom's days are numbered but that these last few holdouts are really going to stubbornly stay put until they're literally forced out. Number 2. Russia's Frozen Ghost Town Located in the Russian Arctic, Vorkuta is a Soviet-era coal mining town that was built by forced laborers during the 1930s. It became home to one of the deadliest gulags in history, known as Vorkutlag. After Stalin's death in 1953, people from all over Russia began to move to the city for mining jobs, Despite the frigid winter temperatures which dip as low as negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit, Vorkuta became a thriving metropolis with a population that peaked at around 250,000 during the 1980s. It boasted high-quality schools, stores, medical clinics, and other services, even though it was isolated from the rest of the world with no roads leading in or out and winters that last for up to 10 months. The collapse of the Soviet Union saw the closure of many of the area's mines and people left in droves. Today, only four of the 13 original coal mines are still open, and less than 60,000 residents remain. Both the city itself and the surrounding towns are filled with abandoned apartment buildings, businesses, and cultural centers. Last year, photographer Maria Passer visited Vorkuta and its nearby ghost towns, where she snapped pictures of deserted apartment interiors filled with snow and encased in ice. She described what she saw as both disastrous and breathtaking. Some buildings that certainly look abandoned and which seem to be falling apart still have a handful of residents inside. You'd never know by looking at them from the outside. Slowly but surely, the region is falling into ruin, with some areas deteriorating visibly faster than others as the exodus continues with no end in sight. Number 1. Chacaltaya Ski Resort The Chacaltaya Ski Resort in La Paz, Bolivia boasted three major distinctions. It was the country's only ski resort, and it was home to the world's highest ski resort and world's highest restaurant. At 17,519 feet above sea level, it sat at a higher altitude than the North Base Camp at Mount Everest. The ski lift at Chakultaya began operating during the 1930s. Little did anyone know at the time it would have no choice but to eventually close due to climate change. By the time scientists began measuring the rate at which the Chakultaya glacier was melting in the 1990s, half of it was already gone. Experts predicted that the 18,000-year-old glacier would disappear entirely by 2015. But it melted even faster than that. All that was left by 2009 were a few patches of ice and snow near the top of the mountain. And of course, without any snow, people can't go skiing. So they stopped coming to the resort, and the resort closed. Its buildings still stand and are maintained by a pair of brothers who remember working at the resort when the mountain was still covered in snow and ice. 
Visitors can still get a hot meal at the property and it maintains its Guinness title as the world's highest restaurant. But not many visitors go there to see the abandoned site and even though there's sometimes enough snow for skiing to be possible, the activity has become a distant memory. Number 9. Djibouti Military Graveyard Located on the coast of the East African country Djibouti, Ilo de Iran is home to a military equipment graveyard. It's here that you'll find a Panhard 178B tank and an M5 Stuart tank. The Panhard 178 is a French-built armored car that was designed before World War II for French cavalry units. It was made to accommodate a crew of four. Number 8. Marthe de Florian Marthe de Florian was a Parisian socialite who lived from 1864 to 1939. She was known for having numerous famous lovers, including former French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, former President Paul de Chanel, and Italian artist Giovanni Boldini, just to name a few. The apartment fell into the hands of de Florian's granddaughter Solange Bogiron, who fled the home to avoid a Nazi raid during World War II. She never returned. De Florian's son, Henri Bogiron, died in the apartment in 1966, and the apartment was simply locked up and left behind. The family continued to pay for the home for decades. It wasn't until 2010 that the socialites' descendants discovered the time capsule that had been left behind. Inside the apartment, they found an array of artifacts, including a painting by one of de Florian's lovers, Giovanni Boldini. The artwork, which is thought to be a portrait of Miss de Florian at the age of 24, sold for $3.3 million at auction. There was also a collection of letters that the couple exchanged. The home contains numerous other paintings, an old stuffed Mickey Mouse, a taxidermied ostrich, old photographs, furniture, and more. It's been kept off limits to the public, and rumor has it that the home contains as many secrets as it does treasures. Number 7. Kang Bashi in recent years, China has increasingly made headlines for its ghost cities that were built and then left empty. Experts estimate that there are at least 50 of these uninhabited metropolises throughout the country. These Guichengs, or ghost cities, sprang up amid China's rapid economic growth. The government wanted to accommodate spillover from modern cities and give opportunities to people living in rural areas, so it set out to urbanize less populated regions. But the plan was overambitious, and many, if not most, of these pre-built cities remained empty or mostly empty. Kangbashi is one good example. Located on the edge of the massive, barren Gobi Desert of Inner Mongolia, this planned district in the city of Ordos was built using money from the region's coal industry profits. It's filled with huge apartment complexes, shopping malls, plazas, a stadium, and towering business and government buildings. There's enough housing for a million people in Kangbashi, but only 100,000 or so moved there after it was built. The government had a goal of moving at least 300,000 residents in by 2020, but it didn't even meet the halfway mark. But as officials have argued, it takes time to populate a city, and it seems as though Kangbashi is finally taking off. A new flight school was built nearby, attracting new residents, and most of the city's apartments have been sold, so it appears as though Kangbashi's days as a ghost city could be over soon. Number 6. World War I Soldier's Bedroom Hubert Rochereau was barely an adult when he left the village of Belabre in central France to fight in World War I. Unfortunately, he died in an English field ambulance in 1918 at just 21 years old. Upon learning of their son's death, Rochereau's parents turned his bedroom into a permanent memorial. They mostly kept it in the condition that he'd left it in, adding some items from his time in the military, including his helmet, medals, and jacket. Hubert's books, military manuals, pipe, cigarettes, pistol, knife, notebook, and other personal belongings were left on his furniture, including his bed and desk. His mother and father bricked up the room, ensuring the preservation of their beloved fallen son's memory. In 1935, the couple bequeathed the home to a close military friend named General Eugène Brideau. The transfer of ownership was contingent upon Brideau agreeing to leave Hubert's room untouched for 500 years. But he fled the country during World War II as a Nazi collaborator and went to Spain, where he remained for the rest of his life. The house containing Hubert's room ended up in the hands of Brideau's daughter, whose husband, Daniel Fabre, still lived at the property as of 2014. Local officials have been invited there to see the room, and the current owner has reassured them that he plans to keep it the way it is. But because the house is privately owned, there's no guarantee that this will be the case once the house no longer belongs to Fabre. In recent years, the mayor of Belabre has used the room's fame as a platform for his mission to make sure it's preserved for years to come. Number 5. Rockahula Water Park 
Back in the 1950s, a California businessman named Bob Byers built a private water park for his extended family off Interstate 15 in the Mojave Desert town of Newberry Springs. It opened in 1962 and grew into a 250-acre recreational facility that was open to the public. The property went by several names over the years, including Discovery Water Park, Rockahula Water Park, and Lake Dolores Water Park. These names reflect the various owners' attempt to rebrand the park as it was continuously plagued with bad luck. Whenever someone tried to polish the property's image in hopes of attracting a resurgence of visitors, it was as if something got in the way. Buyers held on to the business until 1990. He sold it to an investment group who upgraded the equipment and reimagined the park with a 1950s theme. But their luck wasn't any better than Buyers. After operating for just three seasons while accumulating copious amounts of debt, the park closed yet again. One more buyer tried and failed to make the park a success, but the property has been closed since 2004. The weathered, graffiti-covered water slides and other equipment and buildings left behind are an eyesore to many and an urban exploring attraction to others. They're also said to be dangerous. There are rumors that plans are in place to reopen the park yet again, but this hasn't happened. As of September of last year, the property was listed on the market for $1 million. What do you think is behind the repeated failures? A curse, perhaps? Let us know your theories in the comments and make sure to like and subscribe as well. Number 4. Vintage Playroom for years, Reverend Crispin Pauling heard rumors about a hidden room inside the Anglican Church of Our Lady and St. Nicholas in Liverpool, England. In 2014, he opened a trap door in the church's ceiling and went up there, where he discovered a trove of old toys, including a wooden car and a toy train, books and snacks, including a hot chocolate packet. One of the books was dated back to 1696, and another was a prayer book from the World War II era. It's believed that the vintage play area was sealed before the building was bombed during World War II. It was kept that way when the church was rebuilt and was later forgotten. Reverend Pauling told reporters that he decided to explore the room out of curiosity, stating, when you see a hole in the ceiling, I think you've got to go through it and find out what's on the other side. Pauling also said that there were plans to convert the room back to its previous state and to donate the items found inside to a local museum. Number 3. The Crypt of Civilization Beneath Oglethorpe University in the Atlanta suburb of Brookhaven, Georgia, there's an airtight chamber that isn't supposed to be opened until the year 8113, almost 6,000 years from now. Thornwell Jacobs, the university's former president, thought that a preserved museum might offer the people of the future a glimpse into what life was like during our time. Starting in 1937, he started working toward this vision by converting a 20-foot by 10-foot chamber under the administration building into a so-called crypt of civilization. Inside, there's a set of Lincoln Logs, over 800 microfilmed books and religious texts, a TV, a can of Budweiser, an original copy of the script from Gone with the Wind, voice recordings from historical figures like Benito Mussolini and Franklin D. Roosevelt, seed samples, dental floss, a typewriter, a cash register, some children's toys, and more. Jacobs also included a note addressed to whoever opens the crypt, stating, The world is engaged in burying our civilization forever, and here, in this crypt, we leave it to you. He even placed a windmill-powered generator for the electric devices within the crypt, as well as a magnifier for reading records by hand, just in case electricity is no longer used in 8113. The artifacts were chosen and preserved with the help of the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C. To prevent them from decaying, many of the items were placed inside stainless steel glass-lined containers filled with an inert gas. The chamber was sealed on May 25, 1940 by Jacobs and Thomas Kenwood Peters, the crypt's archivist and construction supervisor, in a solemn ceremony that was broadcast on local radio. They welded the door shut and fused a plaque to it with a message on the outside from Jacobs. For his project, Jacobs became known as the father of the modern time capsule. Number 2. Air Raid Shelter for years, residents at an apartment building in Edinburgh, Scotland dismissed an old cupboard in their basement as a storage space. Nobody even gave it a second thought until a new neighbor named Liz Mowbray moved into the building and expressed her curiosity about it. Mowbray and another resident, Mia Gray, worked together to clean the space, which at first glance was full of old paint cans and garbage. They realized that the space was much larger than everyone thought. The pair found wash basins, a heater, and a pair of rotting wooden bunk beds dating back to the World War II era. Based on these items, it's clear that the room functioned as an air raid shelter. It was a place where the building's residents would go during an attack, and then it was forgotten about after the war. Finally, 75 years later, it was rediscovered. Speaking with the local news, Gray described the room as having a bench that wraps around the walls, no smoking signs, an emergency exit, a stove, and two triple bunk beds. 
She said that she thinks there were much more bunk beds, but they were too damaged to identify, and she mentioned that the ceiling is reinforced with metal sheets. Gray believes that a former tenant used the space for storage after the war, but they left so much junk in there it discouraged others from exploring or repurposing the room. Although Edinburgh wasn't a major target during World War II, it was still bombed from time to time. Locals had ample reason to prepare for an attack, and it's likely that the shelter was actually used on occasion. Number 1. Maison Montain Located in the town of Moulin in central France, Maison Montain is a 19th century mansion that was commissioned by a wealthy civil servant named Louis Montain as a place to showcase his antiques and art collection. When he died in 1905, his will dictated that the house would be shuttered after his death, only to be opened to the public a century later as a museum. Montan's wishes were respected, well, for the most part. In 2010, just five years behind schedule and after undergoing extensive repairs for the damage that time had taken on the place, it was open to visitors for the first time. The eccentric man's bedroom is the highlight of the mansion, according to assistant curator Maud Leoduc, who spoke with reporters shortly after its opening. It's filled with gilded leather that was made in southern France in 1712. Léodec described Maison Mantin as pretty standard for its time, but also very eclectic, with a lot of different styles represented throughout. One room, known as the Pink or Four Seasons Room, belonged to Louis Allaire, a married woman that Mantin had an affair with for two decades. It's very feminine, in contrast to Mantin's rather masculine bedroom, with furniture inspired by the style of French King Louis XV. The home's restorers had a tough job cut out for them, with the time-worn mansion covered in insect and humidity damage. But they were careful to make it look exactly the way it did when Montan was alive, giving visitors a rare opportunity to effortlessly step back over 100 years in time. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about fascinating abandoned discoveries, let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.